um, he talked about being terrified as a speaker. And yet he wrote a book that was very popular that required he go on book tour. Like, how do we reconcile these two things? This was in 2004. He talked about this or he shared this experience about being in 2004. And um, he had a, an experience where he froze and um, paying attention to the physical sensations in the body. This is um, a very, this has much to do with mindfulness. So if anyone wants to take classes around mindfulness, um, my wife, Kate, is a teacher of mindfulness and she has not given me the ability to share her coaching practice with anybody on the call. So at some point when she will, I will share it with you, but there are great mindfulness practices out there. What mindfulness does, it, it gets you out of your head and into your body. And if you start to like, what is fear? Basically fear is generally a story, right? We go boom, right into our head, head tells, head talks about the time that we froze in front of our students. It's a com it's a comparison about our worth as a human. It's a versus what Sam shared so eloquently in our podcast. I can't wait for it to come out. But what he shared so eloquently, it was like, great. Now you have this anxiety of being seen. What does it feel like? And as soon as you're going to like, what does it feel like? Where is it in my body? Fe the fear and the anxiety literally can't exist because you're like, okay, what does it sound like? What does it feel like? I don't hear any sounds. It feels like a tightening of the chest, shortness of breath. If you sit with that for like 20 seconds and you're describing it, you're not anxious. Then you're talking about a series of neurochemical reactions in your body that are creating something and you're recognizing that, huh, that's just a chemical in my body and fear all of a sudden starts to feel a lot like excitement, huh? Looks like what I've been telling myself is a story. Now I'm simplifying years of practicing this into a single sentence. So I acknowledge that. But that is a powerful experience for those trying to get over public speaking, trying to get over the fear of putting your work in the world. What does it feel like to read a negative comment? Where do I go? Where does that come up in my body? Stomach, heart, head. Mostly these feelings are from here to here, right? It's from your belly button to your neck. And you're like, okay, sit with that for a little bit. Now, um, let's get out of the neurology for a second, but I, cause I do think it's very much, it, it is the ability to strengthen and condition your neurology is, is an important aspect of it. That is, this is a deeper version of why I prescribe mindfulness or meditation. And it is a thread of most of the top performers in any discipline is their self-awareness and mindfulness. Um, so it's, this is a short you know, the, that prescription is a shortcut for what we're talking about in a little more depth here. Um, the shortest answer that I can give you about my own experience is um, as a young person, I performed and enjoyed it and not dissimilar to Lauren Kelsey started getting, you know, when you start to be in the fifth, sixth, eighth grade range, people start talking to you about, you know, it, it, your ref, people reflect on your personality, who you quote are as you, how you show up in the world. And then we start making judgments about that. Is that accurate? Is it not accurate? Does it make us feel better? Does it make us feel worse? And so to be super fair, like unlistening to that or unlearning what other people have said about you is difficult, but it's literally a matter of repetition. It is a muscle like so many things I'm prescribing. And this is why, this is why it blocks most people because the thought of getting in front of people or this, this is why publishing work is so valuable. If everyone on this call published something every day for 30 days, every day or five out of every seven, at the end of 30 days, you would feel dramatically different about what you put on the world. You would feel, and I'm not just saying a little, I'm saying dramatically different. And it's like going to the gym. How good does it feel the day after your first workout? 
it feels like shit. This is an emotional hangover. As soon as we pushed publish on our work and someone commented, lame. This is t- it's someone that you've never met on the internet took a quarter of a second to tap out L-A-M-E and it is defining your next 24 hours. I'm not saying that that's not human. I'm not saying that that's not natural. I'm not saying that we're not wired for negativity bias. I'm not saying that we have stories about our performance, our capabilities, who we are, who we might be, who others think of us. But I do know that if you did that 30 times in a row, that quarter second that some asshole in Connecticut took to type out four letters does not matter now i we have i'll I'll share a funny story i was i think i shared this earlier i was about to talk in front of somewhere between let's call it ten thousand people somewhere between eight and ten thousand people it was stadium it was i think i'd been hired to to talk at the intel annual company meeting it's literally it was held at the staples center so I'm going on stage in the Staples Center where the LA Lakers play basketball. And I'm backstage with my wife and Kate is terrified for me, terrified. And I've got my noise canceling headphones on and I'm like, and the reason is I'm used to speaking in front of large groups. Kate's not. That's it. That's it. It's a muscle. Now, I, it's important to, the last thing I'm going to say is I, it's very important to not devalue the often hard nonlinear process of getting from, you know, where you are now to where you want to be, but it's just a muscle like anything else. Your task, Lauren Pennywell, is to find out how you can put yourself in that environment in a lightweight way over and over and over. If it's public speaking, it's Toastmasters. If it's putting your work in the world, it's publishing every day. And there are 10 other, you know, analogous ways to practice depending on your craft or what it is that you want to be or become in the world. I'm just giving you a couple of obvious ones. So I do think I'm a natural extrovert. I'm becoming more introverted or I would call it ambiverted at later in my life because I feel like I can actually get more work done. I can make more progress on the ideas and the things that I want to be and become in a smaller environment. Um, but it's not required that you're an introvert or an extrovert. Some of the most successful, happy, fulfilled, talented creators in the world are introverts. And yet they show up on the today show that they show up in places that we need to see their work. So it's available to you with a little practice. All right. Now I never got clear. Aliza, did you have a question or was that a, was that a scratch and not a, I was just, no, Mm, you kind of got a question. Yes. I want to hear from you. Hi. Hi. Is it Aliza? Is that right? Yeah. You actually got it right. Awesome. (laughs) I pride myself on my ability to screw up only 20% 20% of the names, but I often screw them up badly. So if I get yours wrong next, whoever's going to be next, I apologize in advance. But for now, we're focused on you and your question, Elisa. Um, it was a scratch, but I don't really. <laughs> <laughs> but since I'm here, I, sh- I feel like I should um, join the conversation. Um, I, I had started a project a few years ago and then life happened. So then I put it on hold mm-hmm. and being in quarantine gave me the opportunity to bring it back to life. Beautiful. So I started actually part time on that. Uh, found a full time job remotely as a graphic designer. So like financially, I don't have to stress too much, mm-hmm. and I can still do part time on my passion project. And I'm also starting to sell those things. People are sending me great feedback. They're sending me they're like text messages, thank you. Like, and it's like I, I feel like I get trapped at that next. Step. like I don't have a website I'm not selling online uh, I just post the things that I make on Instagram but I even that's rare and awesome. mm-hmm. so it's always like word of mouth or people contacting me like hey I just saw you posted that are you selling this and then that's how I make sales great which is a good thing a good problem to have is just I think then it's the next step I, I I'm constantly blocking myself there cool 
Well, I can't wait for you to go rewatch this the next 120 seconds over and over again after we're done recording this class and it's on the Creative Live website because your prescription is very simple. You are conveniently accepting where you're at right now, which is fine. And yet embedded in you is a desire to go forward because you've talked about, and again, I'm not prescribing this to you. I'm, I'm just translating the words that you used into what I believe having done this a bunch, you, you mean, which is like, I want to go to the next step. I didn't hear you say that. You just talked about the next step as it's, it's distanced from you. It's over there. So I don't have to go touch it because if I can't accomplish it, it's not mine. I don't have to own it. This is fear of success. This is fear of failure. It's fear of a lot of things. It's all based in fear. And you know what? hundred percent natural. 100% natural. This is why I'm going to take you back to I imagine. You need to define, take a second and define for yourself what it is that you want to do. Imagine what's possible. And this concept of imagining is a little scary because it sets you up to potentially fail, to potentially miss the target, to potentially not make it to the next step, whatever that means in your world. But here's the cool thing. If you set yourself up and you walk through this four-step process, I believe that the success and fulfillment that you want from this thing that you haven't, that you have some notion of, but you haven't become crisp on, I think you've got it. I think you've got it in you and I think you can do it. The cool thing is that I think like literally every person on this call without exception has the capability to do some version of the thing that they want to be. Now, maybe if you want to play in the NBA and you're 66 years old, Maybe you can be an NBA coach. Maybe you can be a trainer on the NBA. Like you can get super, super close. So I'm trying to think of the most unrealistic thing. I don't know a lot of 67 year old NBA players, but there's the ability to be so close. And for almost everything else, you can actually do it. What's required is describing the vision, designing a plan to get there, executing that plan, and all the while building community. So your job starting in 72 hours when this is on the creative website, creative live website is to go back and watch this two minutes because the prescription is quite simple. I want you to actually write down the things that you want out of this next step. If you could envision a next step, what would it look like? What is a plan that you can through deconstructing the success of other people, trying what works, seeing what, what, what would the plan for you be to reach that attack that goal, right? Attack that goal, execute against it. And then all the while be showing up as you are here today. And you know what, even if you don't end up doing that thing or your plan varies just a little bit, or in any of these situations, you're going to learn a lot. And maybe you're going to refine your eye just a little bit and you're going to you know, tweak your plan a little bit. And it's going to be within your reach before you know it. The distance between where you are right now and where you want to be is shorter than you think. And this is true for every person. I think you're, you're well on your way. Okay. It's just the next step. You don't have to see all the steps. You don't have to see the whole ladder. It can, it's foggy. There's a jungle between you and where you want to be. All you have to see is the step that's right in front of you. And the one after that, and the one after that, how you doing? Thumbs up, down, sideways, up, down, or sideways, double yeah. thumbs up. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Round of applause. Shout out for Alisa. Awesome. Um, I'm going to take a peek at the other feeds. Mm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Elaine Faber. Maybe it's Alan. Maybe it's Elaine. I just, you know, talked about 20% of the time getting these things wrong and 80% getting them right. I don't know since he's on YouTube live. I'm sorry. Says he's an introvert. Has done 50 videos in 50 days shout out that is that is a serious amount of work As someone who knows what goes into making a video and then here's the punctuating sentence i can already feel the changes the challenges and the rewards so not dissimilar to eliza it's not going to all be rewards you're going to find hard spots but you're going to find some rewards and some areas of opportunity some things to, to work on 50 videos in 50 days. That is serious business right there. <clears throat> All right. Let's see. Um, 
Let's go back to the Zoom. Cool. Oh, Nancy Crow was very fast. You're very fast. And then we're going to go to Henry Travis. Nancy Crow, what's happening? Welcome to the show. Thanks, Chase. Um, you've kind of addressed some of this, but my narrative is worth. Um, before I even launched a photography business, a, a, a five-figure job landed in my lap. Okay. And um, it was a legitimate job, but it turns out it was a person from my past who had known me as a creative person before I did the whole tech thing and mm -hmm. was watching what I was doing. And um, so that was like unexpected success. Mm -hmm. um, now, years later, I haven't matched that because mm -hmm. that sort of reinforced the imposter syndrome, like, mm -hmm. right. Oh, it's someone who knew me. You know, hired yep. me. Um, so I have a really good, uh, sort of social following and I will post photos and out of the blue, someone will say, I want that. I have to have that. Yep. And my immediate response is to figure out how to discount my price for them. Great. Um, my favorite thing about this question <laughs> is that the prescription is, it's pretty gangster, but it's very clear. Is there another question? I kind of interrupted you there. So I want to make sure, is, no, it, no, is, no, it, is it mostly about pricing? The crux of my issue here. Okay, cool. So, we're social animals. We want to be accepted into the tribe, even if we're an, an, an introvert, um, belonging connection. Uh, if a baby is not held as a baby, it will not just not turn out well, it will die, especially early on in that child's life. So that just underscores my point about how wired we are biologically for connection and acceptance. And if you take into this conversation all of the stuff we've been talking about mindset and connection and how to tune in or out to lovers or haters of your work, I think that's all part of this answer. But if we focus on the narrow aspect of two things that you said, Nancy, one, early success and then pricing. Early success is awesome, but it's also very hard. I can't tell you the number of photographers that I have mentored, um, both like one-on-one -on -one like eyeball to eyeball having coffee and on the internet who land a job, uh, a, a campaign for Nike and they think they've made it because they went from shooting for their, you know, local magazine. Someone saw it, someone, you know, promoted their work. Someone at an agency who worked for Nike saw it and they got a campaign for Nike. They think that they've made it. And then, you know, the next um, job does not happen for a long time. Um, this is true, you know, they call it the sophomore slump in, you know, in music and with album releases, with so many things. So it's very common. And so on that point, I want you to know that it's common. Early success is, you know, both a blessing and a curse. Um, so importantly, trying to not compare yourself to that first success, which, you know, for, luck is another reason that we get hired, right? It's not all skill and ability um, or wisdom and genius <laughs> there's a lot of the world is a very uncertain place um, so if you can start to deconnect yourself from disconnect yourself from previous successes or failures and get back to the moment like who am I what can I do now right now not yesterday not tomorrow now over and over and over live in the now um, that's step one and then with respect to pricing it's very easy because you have to be willing to a work on how you mention your stuff it, like word for word script. It's sometimes it's easy to write it down. Sometimes it's easier to practice in front of a mirror. Or it's required that you practice in front of a mirror so you can deliver it. Listen to Vanessa Van Edwards. If you type in Chase Jarvis, Vanessa Van Edwards pricing. I would also encourage you to watch my conversation with Ramit R-A-M-A-T, Seti, S-E-T-H-I, Vanessa Van Edwards and Ramit, Ramit Seti. And if you go back with Ramit, look at my very first interview with him. If you search me on Google and you look to our, we have a conversation somewhere in the 2012 range, I think maybe 13, 14, talking about pricing. My price is $500 versus, this is Vanessa Van Edwards versus my price is $500. 
And the points that you'll get from Rumi are how much value am I adding? If you are an artist and you are charging hourly, I understand why you might be doing that. I think that's the wrong approach because it limits the amount of money that you can make based on time. I like to have a creative fee because a creative fee can be any number. And a lot of photographers get trapped into a day rate. Great, I want you to work for four days. The most you can make then is $8,000 versus I have a creative fee of anything you want it to be based on how much money you know they have, based on how much money they did it for last year, based on that money is on the table for you. So these are very, there, there are very tactical pricing exercises that you can both learn from listening to my conversation with Vanessa and my conversation with Ramit, where we go deep on these things. But ultimately, you have to get really good at a very, very narrow set of things, which is talking about your work and price. I like anchoring it to value. There are some anchor pricing available. There are some anchor pricings available to you in the market. What are other people doing? Like, for example, if you have a video on demand subscription, it's very hard to make that a $200 a month subscription because Netflix is $9. This is, these are realities. But that's why I would like you to then reframe the conversation, which is what, what Ramit talks a lot about, is reframing your pricing around a structure where you can make however much you need in order to make it. And then the delivery of how much your shit costs is practice. I can look someone in the eye and say, yeah, it's, it's going to be 100 grand to hire me for those two days. And some, they may be flabbergasted, but you know what? The difference between getting a hundred grand for something and 10 grand for something is largely who you're talking to. This is why starting to understand where you want to be pricing can tell you who to talk to. Because if you're, if you're happy man, Franco, and you go to, you know, the street fair in Baltimore and you say, you know, my woodblock portrait there is, or my woodblock block landscape is a hundred grand. Do people who show up at a street fair expect to pay hundred grand for a photograph? No. But if that photo is on display at Sotheby's, do people at Sotheby's expect to pay hundred grand for a photograph? Yes. Who's the difference there? What's the difference? The work is the same. The difference is the audience. So if you know where you want to be in the market and you decide who your customer is and you can shop it to them, that's going to help you. Ver Notice how this is intentional. This is not who fucking called me and wants to buy a thing. This is who is my customer? Yeah. Very different. And for those whose ears I offended, it's not a, not a, I'm not known for not speaking like that. So I apologize in advance, but it's also well chosen. And in, in, in um, speaking of intentional, it's intentional because most of you need to wake up to this. If you are just responding to who calls you, you are not driving your business. Okay, this is super critical. If you want to make a living, then, you know, again, selling something for $5 on the internet, how many things you need to sell to pay rent? Right. A lot. This is simple calculus. This is simple math. If you want to, now, there's all kinds of narratives about how much, how long you've have to been in the art world, how many experiences you have to have had. Who do you know that buys shit for a hundred grand? Might need to make a new set of friends, might make me to put yourself in a different place, might need to swim your client base upstream a little bit, might need to get some referrals, might need to, there's lots of things you can do, but as soon as you start defining some of these unknowns, you get really crisp, really quickly. Whew. I got one more question and then I'm going to go get outside. All right. Who wants it? I think that I, did I pick two? I think I did. I went to Henry Travis, right? I said, Nancy, and then I said, Henry. So Henry, we're going to you and your fantastic bookshelf behind you. I'm going to uh, unmute you. There we go. Ask you to unmute. Oh uh, yeah. The soccer ball and Tim Ferriss. Yeah, of course. Right. Uh, I see it. Take, yeah. Thank you for taking my question. And uh, I'm going to iterate what I saw in chat, which was, can't believe this is the last session. I really appreciate your time. And uh, we've been taking notes like crazy. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you for the kind, the kind words. I'm really loving it. I want to have a couple for a couple Saturday mornings to, uh, to, to get outside. This was my normal Saturday morning is when I'm, I'm humping out. Um, but I'm also, I feel really connected to you all. Um, 
seen so many familiar names and and met so many new folks through the course of this and uh, our texting relationship that I'm trying to find more ways to do this. So keep your eyes peered uh, to my feeds because we're going to do more, but I've, I'm getting a ton of juice from this too. So thank you for that and, and stay tuned for more. Um, in the meantime, how can I help? So uh, I finished reading the book this week. And one of the things that I thought was most profound was when you said that enthusiasm is more powerful than confidence. And I'm, when I reflected on my experiences in the past, I saw a strong correlation with when I was enthusiastic about something and when I was successful. So that really kind of struck home with me. And awesome. my question for you is probably pretty straightforward is uh, when you're being offered all these different gigs and you can basically pick whatever you want to work on at this point. Uh, and there are a lot of good ideas that come your way. Um, do you use enthusiasm as a guide to what you choose to work on or other things that, that you um, point to? No, absolutely. Um, enthusiasm is, and by enthusiasm, I mean, how does it make me feel in that moment? Right. In the moment. And you maybe have heard this. Yeah. It's either a hell yes or a no. Okay. And if it's not a hell yes, if it's a, Hmm, I need to think about this. Okay. Right. That's a, and, and, and that is, okay. you know, hell, the, yeah. the hell yes or no. And if it's not a hell yes, like, and for me, the hell yes, it has to check a lot of boxes. It's not just money. It's, you know, maybe it's brand, location, humans. What, what are the human beings that I'm going to be interacting with on a regular basis? Do they have something that I can learn from and be inspired by? Of course, we can all be inspired by anybody and learn from anyone. But are they on my list as someone that I was really excited to work with? Um, whatever the rubric is for you to be able to say yes, it makes it, this goes back to a core value statement. Like, what are you about? Why are you in this? Right. Is it about paying rent? Then if it's about that, then I think you should check yourself. If it's about paying rent, then to me, you're not living the highest version of yourself. Now you can be in a profession that you would love more than anything and still need to pay rent, but notice they're different right? Subtle, but real. And that distinction is up to you to identify. So if things are in line with your core values, and if they make your heart sing, if there is enthusiasm, genuine, heartfelt, earnest enthusiasm, that is what is important to at least set your sights on. Now, the goal of paying rent with your passion is very real. And so I don't want to pretend that there's not a discussion. Remember the, earlier in the book, the big three, um, you know, the, the, the people, um, money and creative control, those things are all going to come up over and over. So I think you should think about those things before you're confronted with those decisions. Um, but, you know, if my world is, uh, I do get to choose those things, then um, the cool thing is that that world is available to you as well. It's not, it doesn't matter how far along on the spectrum you are. I just want to make sure you're being honest with yourself that you're not setting some bar that allows you to say no to things that you should otherwise say yes to develop as a creator or as an entrepreneur or however you define yourself. So um, this is an area where a lot of people stumble and they stumble naturally because there's a, like everything else in this, in this course is a muscle and very few of these things are um, natural we are undoing a lifetime of programming of people who told us what was possible with this one precious life. And that's hard. I want to grant it, but it, it just that it is doable is exemplified in the people that you look up to respect, admire, appreciate, want to be like emulate inspired by all those things. They are living proof that it is possible. You also have moments in your life that when you look back, you felt connected, you felt in a flow state, you were doing things that you wanted with people that you like. Even if it was just for a day, a week, a month, a season, a project, it exists. Look at what it looked like. What were the takeaways that you have from that? How can you replicate that and set some core values around that as a North Star? Because as soon as you have a North Star, as soon as you have a why, making all these other decisions is so much easier. All right. I'm very sad that I have to say goodbye to you all. I'm very sad that this is the last uh, week, the last lesson, uh, session, if you will, in the creative calling book club. Um, 
I, I do want to ask for your ongoing support, sharing, you know, you all sharing the answers, the, you know, pictures of you reading the book, uh, reviews on Amazon. It really does. None of this happens without a community. And it has been a huge part of my individual success, the success of Creative Live. And the cool thing is, is this is what will create success for you all as well. If you're out there doing the work, we are now that we've read the book, we are absolutely crystal clear that the role that community plays in, we're absolutely clear that showing up for others, being the fan you wish you had um, is such an important part of the process. I want to thank you all for showing up. I get tons of juice from this. And um, there are so many comments in the chat that uh, there's a lot of, if you haven't reviewed that yet and you're in the Zoom call, you should. Um, the hashtag creative calling is always available to you. I look at it every single day. If you want to put your work there um, on Instagram or whatever, I share a lot of the stories and the work that I see in the world um, in my stories. Um, I want to finish with a, let's see, let me look, check out my thing here. Um, I want to finish with a closing read. Not everything will be a fit for you. That's okay. Just as I assembled my own approach to life by deconstructing the lives of the creators, the skate punks, world-class performers, and philosophers I've studied, I encourage you to take what works, to integrate it into your own life, and to ditch the rest. If you're simply willing to accept that you are a creator, responsible for designing and living your own dream, I will consider my job here done. As your creative practice deepens and expands, you will experience a greater sense of direction over your own life. You will prove to yourself over and over that you have the power to turn your ideas into reality. This sense of agency and autonomy will bring you happiness and satisfaction like nothing else. Please pursue your own creative calling. All right, that was from page 290. I am so grateful for this community. I hope you've got a lot of value. Leave a review on the creative calling on the on the on the uh, on the book, if you would, on the website. Just participate in the community and show up. I, I see your names out there and know that I am noticing all of you. I'm seeing you. I am looking at your work. And Creative Live is here to support you in whatever we can. I hope you have an amazing day, week, weekend. And I truly am working on trying to do more of this in a sustainable way. So keep your eyes peeled. Um, I'll reach out to you in any of the number of ways that I can. And shout out for everybody who volunteered their own personal story across this class. It was really helpful because if you have a question, so do thousands of other people. So raise the roof, shout it out. Now it's time to do a little dance as we leave and I fade into the rest of my Saturday. I hope you all have an amazing weekend. Thank you.